We want to close this conference by an outlook to digital futures, which was also leading our discussions over all the conference. We want to discuss in this final panel the future of digitalization in the AI, and we want to especially reflect on TA's contribution to the governance of digital futures. We want to highlight three fields, which are, from our perspective, very relevant to think about digital, digital, digital futures. The first field is, what are the techni technicalities behind digital futures? Digitalization is a cross-sectional technology, and even when coming to the questions of what is AI, there is no uniform answer to it. There are several technical areas of AI, like machine learning, like computer linguistic, computer vision, reasoning, planning, and optimization. And AI is an umbrella term for different forms of technical application. There's no one AI and no one digitalization, but AI has very different effects in different contexts. It's determined by its use and has, of course, un unintended side effects. How can we deal with them in different contexts, like the public administration and also the working world? This is something we would like to address at this panel. There are many um, regulatory approaches underway. The Artificial Intelligence Act with a risk-based regulation approach, the Digital Services Act, uh, drawing to online media, the Digital Market Act, the Data Governance Act, as well as also the Data Act. And we want to also ask the question, do we have enough information on the technicalities for the, um, all these regulatory endeavors and which further reflection is also needed from the different fields and contexts. And um, we want to also reflect on the images of AI in the public. Ideas of what the public understands of AI are very different. I read a recent study on a social media analyst of the Otto Brenner Stiftung, which analyzed that um, how from 2018 and 2020, AI was taken up in the public discourse connected to the future of work, but there were two main, main findings by the authors. There's still a strong polarization between optimistic and pessimistic views on AI in the media discourse. And if pictures of AI systems are used, they are mostly humanoid robots, very surprisingly for me. Still, there's lots of mystification of AI, and although it has important effects on our everyday life and work in algorithmic decision-making, matching algorithm, but also in discriminatory effects, we still have to see how to approach the public to it. And um, this is also something we would like to ask, what can be approaches also outside for TA, of TA to making AI and digitalization tangible for the public? And do we maybe also need uh, new formats of participation and enrich our own portfolio here in TA? Raising these questions, we would like to mirror them with some basic observation of technology developments described in TA, the pacing problem. Do we have an issue of timing and societal control here? Or in other words, do we have an information problem with regard to the technology and its impact on society? And do we already have a power problem with regard to maybe log-ins in digitalization and AI and maybe past dependency? These questions cannot only be addressed by the TA community, but are to be negotiated in different societal fields. And so we decided to set up this panel to enrich our TA's knowledge and perspective with external perspectives in order to, complex, to approach these complex questions of the governance of digital futures. So we have a range of experts here, and we will discuss this. But I now hand first over to Jens, to give some more information on the pacing problem and also the Collingridge dilemma, which we took from the conceptions of TA to address the governance of AI futures. Is this already working? So, okay. So don't worry. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of things announced, but we will close very, very uh, much in time, maybe a little bit earlier than 12.30, um, even if this is a broad range of topic. Uh, you, uh, Linda, already mentioned uh, the very idea uh, that, that we had in mind when we started this panel, that we have the impression that we are running a little bit behind the technological development. Uh, this is not a new problem. The social control of technology is a very old topic in technology assessment. It's a very central topic, and it was rephrased in different ways. Uh, in relation to digitalization and uh, yeah, artificial intelligence as well, there, there, was, this, uh, there was this book by uh, Laurie Downs, uh, The Laws of Disruption, where he says 
the technology changes exponentially, but social, economic, and legal system change incrementally. So uh, in a way, uh, this means that we as a society, we are actually too slow uh, for the technology we, de we develop ourselves. So the question is if there is a sort of technical determinism or if, we, if, we, if we're still able uh, to, to, um, to, uh, yeah, to control as a society uh, to what extent and in which direction technology develops. Uh, those who are working longer with uh, already with uh, TA, they are well aware of the Colinwich dilemma. Actually, uh, Linda already rephrased it. I don't have to go into the details. The very idea is that as long as the technology is new, there is still a lot of openness. You don't know where it goes, and there is still a lot of room for maneuver. But you have the problems that you don't really know what the impacts are, and uh, maybe you just don't know enough about the technology uh, to really eff efficiently govern it. And, and once uh, later in time the technology is settled, uh, maybe you have logins, pass dependencies, and so on, and it's much more difficult uh, to change uh, the, the direction or the directionality uh, of the system. So this is about uh, the kind of uh, motivations that we had when we set up this panel, and the very idea was as well to discuss this now with people which are not from the TA community or, or we, which are at least not rooted in TA. And maybe you are doing TA, but you, but you just don't know it. Uh, this happens quite often. But uh, this is not your uh, original background, a part of Armin, of course, and uh, so we want to bring uh, you together with the TA community here. And uh, the uh, very idea is, is that everybody, every one of you, starts with a five-minute statement uh, about your experiences and uh, about your concerns uh, related to digitalization and um, artificial intelligence. And uh, I want to uh, ask uh, or invite, actually, uh, Matthias uh, Finger uh, to start. And you can see that uh, we had uh, discussed with all the participants of the panel before we had that. And uh, you can see for all four of them here that we have a few keywords uh, marked. And this is just to make it easier for you to, uh, to follow the discussion. And I have also to apologize, uh, Melanie Volkamas, she, she, uh, she, she could not come because of health reasons. So Matthias is Professor Emeritus at the Ecole Polytechnique at the APFL in Lausanne. And uh, uh, I don't want to, to make the long introduction. I keep it short. I only want to mention that you recently published, you, you published a, 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 a huge amount of books. But uh, a very recent one is called The Rise of New Network Industries, Regulation and Digital Platforms. And uh, so uh, Matthias, maybe give us... Uh, your views on uh, this topic. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I don't know why you chose me to speak first, but maybe because I'm, I'm talking a little bit in general. First, I don't want to talk about AI per se, but about digitalization. For me, AI is just one of four elements of digitalization. Uh, for one element being the generation of data, another one the transmission of data, the third element the storage of data, and then AI is the analysis of all these data. So it's so so digitalization. <clears throat> um, maybe your first question: Are we lagging behind? Uh, do we have a pacing problem? Yeah, we always have a pacing problem. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> I think. With digitalization, we don't just have a pacing problem. We have uh, a much deeper problem of understanding what digitalization is, what it does. And, you know, then you, you mentioned this Colling Ridge um, question. Um, is, is there still time to... In Actually, we, we are already... <laughs> digitalized and platformed. So that doesn't mean it's too late, but, but, but uh, it's, it's a very powerful, very rapid technology. But so my, my introduction would be really, you know, a contribution to how do we understand this technology? And I'm, I'm not, I'm myself trying to understand the technology. Maybe I should say, um, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm originally a political scientist, but I have worked for 30 years in the engineering environment, in the engineering 
with engineers, uh, trying to explain to engineers that there is more than technology. And uh, <clears throat> I think the specificity of digitalization is that it's not just, um, it, it, it gets at governance. We're trying to govern digitalization, but digitalization is actually a technology that gets at governance. So let me, let me explain what I mean. So we all agree, you said it's cross-sectoral, it's, it's a pervasive technology, it's an interface technology, it's a systemic technology, and basically it applies to the coordination, to the coordination problem, to coordinating actors and assets. And therefore, it applies to governance, to the problem of government digitalization is, and we have to understand what it is an answer to. And I think it's actually an answer not to a technical problem, or let's say the typical problems that technology was, was an answer to, like going faster, having more power, or I don't know, cleaning something better or something. It's an answer to a fundamentally institutional problem, to a, to a governance problem, to a, to, a, to a systemic problem. So <clears throat> the underlying problem is the, the institutional fragmentation of everything, the silos, the levels, Things are decided at tons of different levels. Nobody really in charge anymore. Uh, um, there are very fragmented ways of approaching things. And digitalization answers, answers <laughs> in quotes, is trying to answer that coordination challenge that arises from that ever greater fragmentation and institutionalization, bureaucratization, impossibility to overcome this. So I, so, and I'll conclude. By definition, we cannot, um, we, we are trying to govern digitalization, but by definition, we cannot have an institutional answer because digitalization is the answer to the coordination that we are trying to do. Uh, <clears throat> but digitalization is global. It's above all the traditional institutional actors, and it is private. It's beyond, besides, you know, the traditional institutional actors that were trying to deal with all these issues. They can be part of it, but they are platformized themselves. So, so. <laughs> Everybody is actually platformized as a result of it. And I think the current actors we have, the governments, the national administration, the academia, we can come to, to that, are, cannot really capture that technology because they are themselves part of the problem and digitalization is trying to coordinate them. So I'll stop here and I think we'll we'll have an interesting discussion. Yeah, thank you very much for, um, I took it that there's a big pervasiveness of digitalization on different um, societal, global, and also organizational levels. So we want to give the next statement to um, Lars Adolf. Lars Adolf is um, director and professor at the Federal Institute of Occupational Saf Safety and Health in Dortmund. He um, um, is since 2009 at this Federal Institute, and he is um, head of the Human Factors and Ergonomics Unit when he came there. Since 2013, he is a scientific director of the division Product and Work System, and since 2021, you are coordinating the AI research at Bauer. And um, I just give the floor to you to um, uh, um, uh, share your perspective on our questions with regard to pacing, timing, and the uh, challenges of AI um, from the perspective of um, the Federal Institute's perspective, also from a specific um, political um, um, actor field. Yes. Thank you. I would like to, th first of all, thank you for, for the possibility of being here. Thank you very much. Wonderful 
conference. So my perspective from the Federal Institute of, for Occupational Safety and Health is some, somehow um, a, a perspective from the machine room, I, I could say, because we are dealing with uh, uh, AI digitalization from a research perspective, from uh, a policy advisory role, and um, from working on uh, governance and regulation issues in very concrete terms. So uh, uh, our challenge is to um, get these perspectives and these different uh, um, uh, fields together when it comes to AI. And so we are very much confronted with these questions we are discussing here, pacing or the Collingridge dilemma. And um, my experience is, especially with AI, that we have a, um, for me, in my experience, an, an, a new situation. I try to explain to this, uh, comparing it with the last hottest topic before AI. AI is now our hottest topic in research and when it comes to governance questions. Now, the hottest topic before AI was and is still a hot topic, Industry 4.0, so the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, so we, we saw uh, the visions of um, uh, fully adaptive and flexible uh, production systems and uh, factories, um, the new forms of automation and so on. And um, this was especially for Germany uh, um, especially a hot topic because of um, machinery products and uh, the global market which is delivered um, um, by uh, German companies uh, and European companies. So there was also an, um, an, a, level of, a level of industry politics behind, and it was an industrial politics program behind Industry 4.0. So um, we were also challenged to develop, um, uh, to, to um, uh, define and find the um, <clears throat> um, demands for regulation, for, for questions of governance when it comes to new te technologies in terms of Industry 4.0. Um, and of course, it was assumed uh, that could go fast because it's called, it was in, it's called revolution. But um, we monitored and learned uh, that this revolution uh, was a, not really a revolution, but it spread um, more or less incrementally. Um, there wasn't the new factory built in a short time, but in the existing companies, different technologies um, uh, belonging to Industry 4.0 were implemented uh, on and on. And this was a challenge for the research topics because we had to choose special artifacts. So, um, so the pacing problem was not as, as big as uh, we would have assumed, we had assumed uh, uh, in the beginning. Um, <clears throat> And now we are working on norms and standards for Industry 4.0 and so on, and it is developing. When it comes to AI, we have a very different situation. Um, because if you look at our smartphone, um, we have so many algorithms within it, or if we use it for going to the web and use uh, Google or search engines, we are dealing with a thousands algorithms at the same time, and we are doing it for years. And uh, such to tools and applications are used in the companies for years also. And um, AI technologies are built in machinery in companies since years also. Uh, so AI has already spread and uh, yeah, it is um, ubiquitous, and we, we just heard it. Um, so this is one thing. The other thing is um, there are still many open qu questions, and you said it in your um, uh, introduction, 
um, concerning the definition and the, the basic understanding of what AI is and what not, and uh, how can we uh, uh, catch some uh, aspects of risks and uh, so on. And at the same time, at least the European Commission, but also different nationality, nations in the world, go on with regulations, go on with regulations on AI very fast. So we have a proposal for regulating AI in the European Union, and we expect that it uh, will be, um, will be uh, executed quite, quite fast. Um, so this is a very um, new challenge for us because we have many open questions when it comes to a state of the art in science and technology. We are already dealing with these technologies at a large scale and we, we have regulations and governance proposals um, we have to work on very fast. So this is a very challenging and new situation um, and when it comes to the working world and questions of safety and health, we are in the middle of, these, um, uh, uh, of this problem. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot from these impressions from the machine room, as you uh, mentioned it, and uh, <laughs> to make this clear difference between Industry 4.0 and artificial intelligence. I'm sure that we come back to this uh, point. But uh, first of uh, for, as, as the next step, I want to introduce uh, Sonia Thiel. She's a historian, philosopher, and uh, museologist, and she's been the head of AI development at Badisches Landesmuseum since 2021. Prior to that, she worked as a curator for various cultural history museums with a focus on participatory processes. And actually, I think uh, that, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why you are uh, here in this round. I remember Armin Grunwald just saying in the session before that it's as well important to build bridges, uh, to build bridges, I would say, here for technology assessment, to build bridges between technology society and or between science, technology, and society, and uh, my impression is that your work is uh, going into this uh, direction. So uh, may I ask you to give your five-minute statement, please? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm also very happy to be, be here and get to know the TA community better. So um, as you just said, I come from a very different perspective than... Uh, the former statements, and um, yeah, I'm uh, happy to present you um, a little bit a more practical um, approach. Um, so my uh, statements here in, in the back are uh, museum um, participation and transparency, and that's exactly like the field I'm working in. So um, as a um, curator um, um, responsible for AI development at Baden State Museum, um, uh, we use a, um, yeah, a, a deeply participatory approach to implement um, AI solutions to the institution and to the museum world. Um, and um, yeah, let me <laughs> let me um, tell you a little bit uh, about the participatory processes and why we deal like that um, uh, uh, with the with the field of AI. Um, so it's. Um, it's been a long history um, on participation in, in the museum, so it, it was uh, uh, based on um, feedback from a citizen advisory board to implement AI solutions to the museum. And uh, based on this, the project I'm working in was, uh, was set up. It's an international project um, together with um, Amsterdam Alad Pearson Museum um, and uh, from, from the University of Amsterdam. And the goal is to, um, a very concrete goal, to use um, artificial intelligence solutions to um, uh, develop an AI-supported storytelling tool and deal with the digital collections. So very, <laughs> very concrete. And, uh, um, um, yeah. and um, so the goal is to further open up um, museum digital collections and make them more accessible. Um, and um, the, the problem to solve is to make the large amount of data uh, yeah, more accessible. Uh, in order to achieve this, um, it's, um, it was a, um, a 
step, uh, um, uh, yeah, we, we um, chose several steps to um, find out what's the, what's the goal of um, how to use artificial intelligence. So I think that's perhaps for you community the, um, an important point um, that it's not uh, very clear in the beginning why should we use AI. Yeah, and um, um, how could we how could we implement um, participatory um, um, surveys or talks um, on how exactly in our field should we should we implement AI? I think that's that's uh, the first starting point um, to have a common ground and to to find the goals. So find the goals and then find the problems, of course. So why should we solve? several problems with AI. That's the second thing we are doing. Um, in, um, yeah. And um, in, in the process, we, um, we use several participatory approaches like surveys or talks or um, also um, AI pilots um, to, um, yeah, to develop and to uh, accompany the technical development and to keep it very close. So to keep the technical development very close to what the user really needs and from the very beginning on. So I think that's uh, probably a finding you already have in your TA uh, research that, that it's useful to, uh, to do so and not to develop something which is perhaps very advanced on a research or technical level but um, really not useful for the end user. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, perhaps I um, finished my first statement here and um, hope we will have a good discussion about that. Yeah, thank you. So that's very interesting that the museum who's dedicated to the past, opens for the future, uses new technologies and does it from a user perspective even from a bottom-up level. So thank you for sharing these thoughts on the museum and um, also your uh, approach to include uh, citizens in making um, AI accessible for the public and also open spaces. So the last um, five-minute statement, we want to ask Armin Grunwald um, for this statement. I'm not so sure whether I need to present you in this round, but since we have some newcomers, we might say that you are a professor at KIT, that you are the leader at ITAS, and or that you're also um, head of the um, Office of Technology Assessment in Berlin. Thank you, Linda. Well, I will talk uh, some minutes about this pacing problem and the final stage of these five minutes, I will come to TA. Um, before the pandemic, I had a huge amount of public lectures on, um, on digital transformation of ethics uh, and so on. And I liked to start by, by a quote in order to, to give an expression to the feeling of many, many people at that time and probably also today. And I don't know it by heart exactly, but it's in the following way. Well, we are living in a wonderful, but also challenging and quickly changing time. Um, things change so fast, uh, we don't understand most of them. Sometimes we understand, but as soon as we have understood, things are gone again already, and the next thing is there, we again do not understand. This quote, not really a quote, uh, it was published by American philosopher John Dewey in 1927, so almost 100 years ago. And in, that, in the same decade, William Ogburn, uh, American sociologist, developed his theory on the relation between society and technology, and he was the first one to, uh, yeah, to, to create this idea of technology determinism, that technology goes ahead and society uh, lags behind, has to catch up, and if society does not catch up fast enough, then problems and tensions will occur. Okay, almost 100 years ago. Things are changing so fast. They are even changing faster today. There's no doubt about uh, this, I guess, because of many issues, but digitalization is one of the most important drivers of acceleration. One reason is the technology itself, because uh, with software, with algorithms, with digital twins, things can be made much, much, much quicker, faster than to deal with matter, real matter, or with bioorganisms or so. Uh, so the, the digital world allows 
extremely fast uh, operations which then which uh, allow results which then can be transferred to the real world and used for decision making or developing techno new technologies and whatever and the second reason is of course it's obviously uh, the globalization and in particular the global competition the race for ai for example so we can see this race between the united states china europe um, uh, recently i learned that um, 1,000 new AI professorships shall be implemented. 1,000, not in the European Union, not in Germany, in Bavaria, in the state of Bavaria, 1,000 new AI professorships that shows about the appreciation of AI in the, at the political level. Of course, they, they believe that AI is the future and that those who don't invest in AI today will be punished in some decades uh, because then they will lag behind, they will lose welfare and whatever. So there is a strong belief system among policymakers and in the economy that AI is the future. And this belief system changes budgets and allocation of, of, of monies and, and euros, billions of euros and so on. And that creates path dependencies and, uh, and uh, fuels the dynamics, which is already there, fuels it further. Um, and it is also fueled by the big companies, by the big five. They are the biggest researchers on AI and other uh, digital technologies in the world, I guess. Okay, now what's about the feeling of quite normal people? Well, service demonstrate clearly there is a high belief in technology determinism. Yeah. So uh, we, uh, the, the surveys demonstrate where well, people think technological progress, digital transformation, they go, simply they go on, we can't do anything, we should be uh, perhaps at the forefront, and we have to adapt ourselves. We have to proactively adapt, and in uh, German language the slogan is uh, used Wir müssen uns fit machen für die Digitalisierung. Ja, we have to condition ourselves proactively for the digitalization. So that is technology determinism uh, per se. Now, coming to technology assessment at the end of my five minutes. Um, as I entered the field of TA in 1991, the idea of technology deter determinism was still strong at that time. Also, the idea of the value, neut value neutrality of, of technology was strong at that time. Um, TA fought against this, these, these both ideas. Uh, I was part of that fight. And yeah, so after 10 or 15 years, I thought we had won, won the battle. Uh, because Social constructivism came, you know, Weber Biker, the famous book on social construction of technology in 1987 already. Peter Weingart in Germany, Technik als sozialer Prozess. The discovery that technology is not made um, in some miraculous engineering context where nobody can look into, but it is made by engineers, by humans, uh, through a series of decision-making processes. And the basic idea of constructive TA 1995 was to go into these processes of decision making to enrich these processes by knowledge about what society expects, expects from technology, on, of demands, concerns, and so to contribute to a better technology in a better society, as Ari Ripp and authors wrote it in their famous book on, in 1995. So, with this book and this movement, shaping technology became the slogan of that time. Not adapting to technology, following the idea of technology determinism, but shaping technology according to our values, our ideas of a good future. And in TA we tried to support and to realize this approach over many years, and other approaches came uh, enter the field, uh, like um, value-sensitive design, for example, there's the design idea included, and also the, the responsible research and innovation idea is, has been motivated by this idea of shaping 
technology and in, in particular here innovation. And René von Schomberg put it in a paper around 2010 in the way we should go for the right impacts, yeah? for the right impacts, not prevent risks as GA had done in earlier times, but go for the right impacts, a good future. Okay, that was a great movement, but now to contrast this with uh, what's going on in digitalization and AI, this acceleration, hmm, I guess this emphasis came to an end uh, because there's a barrier with these new developments, more or less new developments in the digitalization. And what I dare to say, and it is a thesis for discussion, I don't have the statistics on this. My impression is that the emphasis on shaping technology, value-driven and so on, that this did not completely disappear, but it lost our it, it lost importance and significance in our field. And on the other side, uh, the notions such as risk assessment, risk governance, they came back. They are now at the forefront of TA again as they were 30, 40 years ago. So there is a kind of bigger movement ongoing which affects TA, in the sense we could say TA is back to its roots, to the origin, risk assessment, unintended side effects, prevention, regulation. Um, yes, that's in front of us. We should not forget about the shaping technology idea because yeah, that's much more attractive if we could again come to this idea back. But in the meantime, I guess we have to, um, to get old notions out of the box. We had hidden them like the watchdog. TA as a watchdog, perhaps some of you know the famous paper by um, Ruth Smith, I guess, uh, and Johann Scott, um, TA a tracker dog or a watchdog. And they didn't like the watchdog. But today, perhaps some, we need perhaps a watchdog again and um, the other issue my predecessor, Herbert Paschen, often used TA as early, early warning. Yeah? Uh, early warning, inform, informing policymakers, society, and then looking for good solutions for risk governance, responsible risk governance, for example, in these many fields of digital transformation, in particular AI. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. So, Jens. We have to reflect a little bit <laughs> on our questions of the pacing problem. We have now very different perspectives. We have the pervasiveness. We have the um, information and power problem, regulation and power problem uh, from the perspective of the Bauer at the same time. So it comes together, um, information and um, also regulation. We have the museum who puts the... Uh, is responsible for the past and looks for the future. And we have Armin Grunwald who says, well, there's a speeding up process, there's a um, shaping vision before, but now we have a backlash to the past a little bit in order to uh, bring um, regulation um, at the forefront and cautionary aspects. What can we learn from that for the pacing problem? No, actually, I'm quite optimistic, uh, So, uh, but I'm always optimistic. Um, I learned as well that, that we are, uh, as, as we are uh, well, we, uh, to a certain extent, I would say we seem to be on track. Uh, we tackle these problems from different angles. And, uh, of course, the technology assessment, uh, I mean, it has, uh, this would be a point for discussion, I think. It, it has, to a certain extent, uh, it, uh, it, it has to adopt to the problems uh, that exist. And might, maybe the problems, they have changed uh, over the last, or the probably they have changed over the, over the last 30 and 40 years. So uh, new uh, methods uh, or old methods uh, uh, might be needed that have been uh, forgotten uh, for a couple of years. But um, I was wondering, and I would like to continue with um, maybe one more round uh, before we open up uh, for, for questions. Uh, I, I want to pick up uh, the notion of Armin in the end, the weak signals and the watchdogs, and I would like to 
uh, pass this one uh, first uh, to to Matthias Finger and, um, and maybe and then to a certain extent as well to the others. Uh, early warnings, uh, Matthias. I think uh, remembering what you said, it's too late for early warning because uh, you said it's already here. It's it's everywhere. And uh, and I, I was wondering, um, what is about the knowledge dimension? You briefly mentioned that. Do we have enough knowledge about artificial intelligence, uh, about digitalization? Do we need more knowledge? I had the impression that you would say, well, it's actually too early uh, to to make uh, to, to go for actions. Uh, to go for regulations, uh, should we be even slower? Yeah, you, you put me in a, in a difficult spot now. Um, I thought this was my job. <laughs> um, how, sh how shall I start? The d digitalization is moving on everywhere. <laughs> and fast. And so people are thinking about it. It's not that people are not thinking about it, but they think about it from their particular perspective or from their particular situation. And none of that is wrong. You know, uh, you are concerned by, I don't know, I, I just walked through the room. Okay, the digitalization of trees in Karlsruhe. Fantastic. You know, we okay. So, so we can use that technology somehow to do what? <laughs> uh, so, so, so I mean, what I see with this with this digital broader than AI, but it's 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 attractive. <laughs> Uh, people want to use it. All my students that I had formerly, they want to do something with it. <laughs> uh, to solve what problem is not really clear, but uh, everybody thinks that it has something to contribute. So what, what I think what you want me to say, uh, at least what we discussed in, in it's what, what I think we really need is, you know, some some thorough understanding of the, the um, it's like the elephant, not just this and that and that, of what this whole thing is all about, where it is going, how we can control it or shape it somehow. That's the classical question. Is it, and, and, and I'm not sure, I mean, what I observe, but I'm working in the, in the world of public administration, regulation, European Union, uh, you know, all these people who try to make rules about something, it's, it's totally piecemeal, not systematic. I mean, I, I don't want to criticize the EU. I think they are the best still, <laughs> trying to put some serious thinking into the whole thing. But, but you know, there are premises, we should be competitive, but at the same time, we cannot be because we already missed the boat. So what can we do? Then we regulate a little bit. There is no, no real, I don't know, no real understanding of all this. So let, let me just, it's a little bit abstract. So let me very concretely, I work, for example, on digital mobility, okay? The, the physical mobility being digitalized and you, you can, okay, so that's good, okay? You, you have your app, you can go here and there, you can buy your ticket or not yet, uh, but in, eventually it will come. We need more rules to make that, but there is an underlying problem. To do what? To help what? To solve what problem? To, to to, for, for what societal purposes? Is it to make mobility faster, better, bigger? Or is it to control it? And I, I conclude here um, on, on a very practical thing. As a political scientist, I'm, I'm worried that these platforms, the connecting of everything, is without any purpose. You, and I see it from my students, from my engineering students. Okay, we have data, we connect something, we do something. 
For what? Not clear. So, so how do you bring back public policy objectives into digital platforms that organize something? Energy, water, media, news. Um, they optimize something. <laughs> but, but, and they optimize it. Maybe I should stop, stop here. But the, they optimize the, the tradition. Now, now, thinking about, I was in, a, in an environment of, I built up, my fault, I built up a whole department of management of technology, okay? Economists, okay? And, and <clears throat> basically, what they wanted was to use these technologies in exactly the same traditional way. So, so the idea was, okay, we have customers, business community, we have customers, and the technology will solve to save the customer, uh, will serve the customers better, okay? And somebody will make more money in the process, okay? Uh, which is okay. But what platforms do is not that. They are multi-sided. They serve the customers who want to drive, who want to ride. They serve the companies who want to sell taxi rides and car rides and bus rides and things like that. They serve advertisers who want to use that community to piggyback. So the platforms themselves are optimizing a network that does not solve a problem. It solves their own problem of how to create more network effects, which becomes a goal in itself. And that's my, that's my, the goal, the goal is what ultimately? And to understand that, I think that's what we need. And I don't think we have understood it yet. The EU is good. My son works for it. He works for all this stuff. Uh, but they are always worried about how can we catch up and not be, st not be behind? But catch up to do what? So you raise very much the value point of digitalization and the values behind that we shouldn't lose the track of them because of all the things going on so um, quickly. Yes, we have a second round for questions and answers. We also want to look a little bit in the future, to the future in the second round, what is needed from the future. But I think it was also very interesting to look also in the past or to also compare the situation in the past. And the Bauer is dedicated also to risks assessment, what you describe, and maybe it would be interesting to learn a little bit, little bit from your um, organizational perspective. Risk assessment, is this something new which is done for artificial intelligence in the work surroundings, or is risk assessment, you, can you use the same methods at, 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 as you did before? Or is there something new needed also for the future? Uh, actually, this is one of our most researched questions uh, today. Um, so uh, our role is uh, um, traditionally uh, somehow to be a kind of a watchdog to, to identify to identify risks, to analyze them, to assess these risks uh, in the working world for the people. And so uh, there is also a, a whole bunch of methodologies and there is also a consensus about standards of risk assessment when it comes to um, uh, traditional technologies, uh, let me say. Um, <clears throat> and if we look at the future, uh, and, and we do have um, governing tasks when it comes to product safety problems. Uh, we have to do risk assessments for, for example, industrial machineries. And we can do this, we are used to it. Um, and with the uh, EU, EU regulation proposals, um, uh, we see the task uh, uh, to, to conduct concrete risk assessments for uh, AI technologies used in, 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 uh, in organizations and companies. Um, so, and uh, we have some kinds of risks like accidental risks or concrete health risks um, we, we can talk easily about, um, but we, all, we, we, we already have seen this. All these multi-purpose uh, 
um, applications of digital platforms and tools and applications do have many side effects when it, and uh, these relate to um, personal rights, um, data protection, etc. And it does not make any sense to uh, 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 to exclude these kinds of risks because for perhaps these are the major risks coming uh, coming along with uh, using artificial intelligence technologies and companies. But we don't have the tools, and um, the classical tools are, are challenged for it when it comes to these risks. But um, if we have a little deep dive, even if it comes to uh, classical machinery technologies, and an AI system is implemented in a, in a machinery in a factory, and because of this, it is not, uh, uh, this machine does not uh, rely only on deterministic rules and processes, but because of AI, it works with probabilistic uh, functionalities. So it is a very basic challenge for us uh, how to um, evaluate reliability and safety of these functions. So there are, this is a very different level of uh, 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 risk assessment than related to uh, data protection, personal rights, and so. But this shows the, the, the bandwidth of uh, uh, new challenges, and these are already addressed in EU regulation proposals, but we still have no solution for it, and this is... Uh, uh, yeah, we, we have to hurry up very much because, oh, yeah, uh, it, will, uh, uh, it will be a challenge when it will be realized. Do you feel you have the manpower, the capacities, or the woman power in uh, the administration? Of course or? not. <laughs> um, uh, but it's not only manpower. It's um, in, 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 at the first place, we need the competencies. So... Um, Oh, I myself, I, I'm a psychologist, I, I, um, and uh, um, when I studied, I, I haven't learned about uh, artificial intelligence. For God's sake, I learned about statistics and mathematics uh, something, and uh, some major parts of artificial intelligence are basing on statistics and mathematics, or mathematics is the core of artificial intelligence. But uh, I myself, I'm an example. I'm forced to learn fast about artificial intelligence. We as an institution are, are challenged to hire um, uh, software engineers um, um, and data science specialists um, to um, build up our competence profile for being, for being um, ready for the challenges. And, but, it's, but this is difficult when we look at the labor market. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm um, just thinking whether we open up for the public. Um, yeah, maybe just a, a last question to yeah. uh, Sonia Thiel. I was, yeah. I was wondering um, when uh, the public or the people are confronted with artificial intelligence, uh, is there a ten tendency that they want to know more about it, more about how it works, or they just want to use it and apply it? That's an interesting question. Um, I would say uh, both. Um, on, on the one hand, there is the tendency of, um, okay, Either it works or it uh, doesn't. Um, I'm interested in, in a specific function. I, for example, I want to get a story. Give me the story. Um, I don't uh, care about what technology lies behind it. Uh, so this is, um, on the one hand, um, a position. Um, and on the other hand, there's a <clears throat> of course, there's a big need and a big um, information gap uh, we have about artificial intelligence. And I think museums or... Um, yeah, public spaces, educational institutions like uh, universities and, or um, yeah, open spaces can bridge this gap or address it with several formats like here at ZKM does since uh, for years already um, with artistic positions um, like to, to bring this technology nearer to people or um, yeah, there are um, several events you, you, you can attend to, to learn more about um, techniques and uh, um, 
um, yeah, um, how to use it. And I think that's, um, that's probably the, um, yeah, I think both is um, under totally understandable that um, yeah, museums bridge this gap and on the other hand, just deliver um, 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 and, and use techniques, but um, don't explain it. And we, we find kind of a middle way. We, um, we use AI techniques and um, explain uh, on a very simple level uh, what, what's the technique behind. And um, yeah, so I think that, <laughs> that um, that's, I think that's my, that's my core point to, to many of these uh, discussion points we had, that uh, we have um, definitely a huge information um, need and an information problem and uh, that, that we definitely need more knowledge and competence building on, uh, on AI technologies and how to, how to use it, how to implement it. And um, yeah, I want to encourage you to, <laughs> um, to use different spaces for, for doing so. And Thank you. Armin, are you now a little bit more optimistic learning from an economic <laughs> with a professor with an economic background that he argues for values, learning from um, Lars Adolf that the Bundesanstalt is hiring a lot of competences and also puts in um, data engineers and learning that the Badisches Landesmuseum is very active in the uh, AI applications. So might there be some tendencies for shaping again <laughs> of the digital future? I'm always in favor of shaping, of course, yeah. <laughs> Um, my concern is only that at the moment in these years we have to um, to get the watchdog out of the box again for some years hopefully only and then we will back to in, at another in another era of shaping but also now we go for shaping where as far as it is possible of course and uh, at, at ETAS, for example yeah we have some studies ongoing yeah on on shaping uh, digital technologies, co-shaping -shape, with the computer scientists and so on, looking for, for methods and approaches. So um, this is ongoing, but it does not, it does at the moment not reach the level of this uh, dynamics of the thousand AI new professorships in Bavaria. How shall we cooperate with thousand new professors in Bavaria? Yeah, and, or with Google or with Amazon, yeah, with the big players. Mm -hmm. So there's a dynamics ongoing at the moment where our access is limited. Thank you. So I think we open now up for the general um, discussion. It's open for questions. <coughs> For the, from, from, from you, we will also um, might have questions from the house base. No. Okay, we don't have questions from the house base, so we uh, just pass over to Somit Saha, and I pass my mic. Some easy question. No, no. Actually, actually, uh, uh, you don't know, but my my wife is a forester, and she works on she works on exactly the urban trees. So that's why I was I was uh, interested. Of course, I I did. I think you're doing the right thing. Digitalization is very useful to to see because trees talk to each other. They are ecosystems themselves. You know, so so it is a very uh, uh, a very useful kind of work you do. The digitalization helps you to visualize the whole thing. The, 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 it helps you, um, I don't know whether you do this, but I saw it in Korea. They, they water the trees according to their needs and no longer just, uh, you know, so, so there is a lot. But you are right in the sense that the values have value if you call it values i don't know it's for me this is a management question <laughs> the per the 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 purpose of management has totally changed you need to keep them alive you need to uh, to find species that are adaptable to the heat uh, and you wish hope that the trees can actually cope with this we don't even know <laughs> Uh, that that they can adapt fast enough to the kind of changes. Uh, the, so yes, it's no longer to have it beautiful or green or wh whatever. It's it's really 
it becomes functional in the overall urban systems. And so my, my point here is, I don't know whether you use that word, uh, but I use the word green infrastructures. It becomes an infrastructure like the water, like the streets that you have to manage because the city, the, the air, the temperature can no longer continue um, if we do, and we need, we need digitalization as a management tool for these purposes. So, so I, I, I didn't want to criticize you. I wanted to, to highlight the importance of, of, of what you're doing. But that's a very precise utilization of digitalization. You know, uh, I'm not sure whether any of the big platforms is interested in what you're doing. <laughs> I, 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 maybe I don't want to monopolize, and frankly, and, but two things to, to say. The, what the digitalization creates efficiency gains. It, create, it, it makes things, coordination more efficient. Okay. Now, two questions here that, that relate to what to do. One is, who appropriates the efficiency gains? And it's the private platforms. They don't produce anything. Have you seen Amazon producing anything? They simply appropriate the efficiency gains of coordinating better. Okay? And, and that's fine in the private sector, but once you do it in the public sector, transport becomes more efficient thanks to the mobility apps and all that. The, the, the money that is the efficiency gains are, up, are appropriated by the private platforms and not reinvested in the, in the infrastructure that you actually use for transport. Because what does Uber say? Uber says, okay, we don't reinvest, we, we take advantage of the infrastructure that exists. We don't reinvest because if your infrastructure is too bad, we just move to another city. It's a global, it's a global thing. So that raises the last question is really, is there public service? How do you bring public service values, that's my public administration thing, into these platforms that fundamentally just create more efficiency? Is the platform a public service? Of course, Uber says we are not a public service. Okay. Uh, is the underlying train a public service, but the platform, the, the, the app is not? But then the train says, if we cannot sell the tickets, why should we even provide a service? So those are the kind of questions that, that are raised. But sorry, I don't want to mobilize, uh, monopolize. <laughs> try to keep it short, it's, it's a wide range. Um, so thank you for your, your, your question. Um, um, so first of all, um, storytelling is one aspect, it's not the, the main one, so and um, uh, we, we took a lot of time to, to get really uh, get the goals for how to use AI, yeah? and uh, that took, a, took some time, and uh, the main goal is accessibility and uh, make connections visible, so I think and storytelling is, uh, is one aspect. Um, the interesting thing of, about storytelling is, um, and we are getting there at the moment, um, is uh, on the one hand the, the human-machine interaction, so not uh, um, generic storytelling on its own, but more the, okay, how could the, um, um, how, um, how could AI, AI help people to um, um, generate stories um, they are not yet there? Yeah, so uh, that's that's one part, but we can discuss it in detail later. I'm happy to hear your opinion. Um, so that's the one thing, and and the other thing is um, that all the, these discussions more have a uh, yeah another function to, for example, to discuss uh, um, large language models. Yeah, how should we use them? Should we should we and we can use them like in a totally silly way. Yeah, we can create. Uh, 
totally uh, yeah, big lies <laughs> out, of, out of them, or we could um, use them to create serious content and uh, to, like, to get the balance um, out of it and to, to, to judge these uh, language models um, together with the people and to learn about how, how do they work, how should we implement them and all that stuff. I think that's one uh, important part of the discussion and, and yeah, I think we are all learning with them. And the last, last thing is the, um, about the, what kind of content should museums provide to learn. I think that's more make something visible, yeah? Um, make make uh, processes visible. For example, how do AI models um, evolve, evolve with the, uh, the the work, unvisible work of millions of people? Um, yeah, for example, I think that's that's um, one very important thing. And yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, we were wondering if this is enough material for one and a half hours. It's far too much again. So it's, <laughs> it's always like that. I would just pick out the third question, if I may. And uh, I mean, I, I feel very much in the same direction. So is it, what, what is missing, in my understanding as well, is, is visions. For example, in the mobility sector, we can discuss a lot about the potential impacts of automated cars, as long as we have no real agreement uh, what kind of mobility system we actually want to have in the future. And maybe it's a little bit different. Um, uh, it, between different fields of application in energy, for example, we have quite clear targets, actually. Yeah? You might like them or not, but they are there. So, And, and I would uh, like to pass this um, or rephrase it a little bit uh, to make it uh, also a question uh, for you, uh, uh, Lars Adolf. For, um, to what extent do you have the impression that there is a, a clear vision or a, a clear target where all this development and all the works that are, you are doing in administration is, is, is leading to or or do you, do you, would you share this impression that there is also, also a lack in clear targets and in goals and in, in, yeah, in visions, in a way, in desirable futures? Yeah, um, we have lacks of clear vision, clear targets, and uh, to understand the situation fully. So to make it in, in, in concrete terms, typical for our work, uh, if we have uh, to... Um, um, uh, work on an, on an old regulation about the workplace safety. We, it was always sufficient to, to do it more or less uh, in a five-year rhythm. Um, but if you look at AI, um, you all know, if, if, if you um, look at the publications, there are thousands and um, uh, uh, every week or every day, uh, even if you only look at German universities, uh, you have thousands of new projects, uh, ideas, very different, very varying um, every, every day. Um, so it is not possible to, to grasp all these uh, innovation. And uh, it, we, we try to do it uh, to, through surveys, for example, um, and ask, um, ask the working people about artificial intelligence, but then we have the problem that nobody knows uh, for sure what it is and what it means. So there is a, a, a large um, um, uh, span of understanding and so not very reliable uh, results in uh, such monitoring attempts. So, yeah, we, we are really uh, exactly in this process to to learn about more, to get more clear understanding what will be really relevant for the working world um, and what, what has uh, real chances to get realized, um, what are the related risks um, and how can we deal with them. So, yeah, um, you see I'm not uh, um, ready for this at this time. Um, it's our challenge. Yeah, so a few words only. A uh, few words to, to Ulrich. Yeah, this um, interest of capital. Does capital in itself has an interest? Well, we could talk about words, but I know what you mean. What you mean? 
um, in my eyes, in my understanding of TA, TA is inclusive, participatory. That means including citizens, stakeholders, actors, and so on. Uh, for at a round table, for example, and at some occasions or opportunities, there might also be a banker sitting on the table. No problem. But in this, in its assessment process and in the uh, evaluation of technologies. <laughs> Um, in, in um, elaborating um, pathways to a good socio-technical future in some fields, TA is, in my eyes, common, common good oriented, not capital oriented. So we have to take into account that capital is a strong player. Or the actors behind the capital are strong players in the world, and sometimes TA might be a bit naive about this. But again, our work is not capital oriented. There are many other agents in the world which assess technologies capital-oriented, in a capital-oriented way. We do this business in a different way, common good-oriented. And this leads to the vision issue of Rini. Um, yeah, I guess the answer is we have to simply stick on our traditions in TA. I still like this phrase I quoted an hour ago, Uh, of Ari Ripp and colleagues, TA for a better technology in a better society. Well, that's wonderful. Okay, for technology, yes, I guess you agree, because we can contribute to a better technology either indirectly by serving regulation, for example, pre preparing for regulatory uh, measures uh, concerning AI or whatever. That is an indirect uh, contribution to better technology. And the other way, shaping technology would be a direct contribution by feeding in our knowledge, our wisdom, as you said, uh, into the engineering processes in the expectation that better, that the outcome would be better. <laughs> okay, and by doing this, I am convinced that we also would contribute to a better society because issues such as inclusion, uh, fairness, justice, Uh, they are not only restricted to the area of technology and its usage and so on, but it's an issue of society. So that is the vision behind. That's what drives me. And so I will never get depressed, uh, also not in face of problems or challenges, whatever. So that is a, a vision for, for, uh, for which it is worthwhile to, to take all the effort to make TA. Thanks. I wanted to make a link between several of the questions, but shortly. So, you know, yes, the interest of capital. Um, <clears throat> and I'll take the exam. So, so smart city is a very good example. Uh, but I wouldn't call it capital. It's companies. Uh, IB IBM created the term smart city. It's their term. Okay? And then they tried to sell it to the cities. And then everybody else went with similar intelligent city, innovative city, I don't know what, what else was invented, uh, to the point that IBM said, uh, we have to find a new term. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so they, their slogan is now smarter cities. Okay. So basically, <clears throat> the, no, two points here. One is these companies are not coherent in themselves. They sell different stuff to the cities. It doesn't give a smart city. It just gives some aspect of it. Some want to sell telecom infrastructures. Other want to sell software. Third one want to sell consulting. A Boston consulting group, smart city is their thing. Okay, so, so <clears throat> the, the, the cities get very contradictory, different advice. They, they, they buy stuff that they don't need. They don't know what it needed for. And, and so at some point, the cities react and say, okay, we need to put some order into this kind of thing. And are we really, what do we actually want? And, 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 and that's where probably the, the TA community comes in. We can help you to basically decide Uh, to, to what, what is this digitalization actually for, and what, for what is it useful, for what is it not? Uh, where, where, and at some point in the process, and, and, and you, the person from Holland, you know, for me, Holland is a mega city, it's just a big city. It's, it's, 
Yeah, I'm from Switzerland. It's also a, a big city. It's just a metropolitan region. Okay, and so these cities they get together and or they 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 say, okay, now let's start to think. <laughs> What are the priorities? What is it useful for? What is it not? Where we do we want to? So that's part of the reactive process. And I see it happen everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so how do they do that? And, and I think that's the optimistic piece. And then my, my last publicity to it. I mean, it's interdisciplinary. You need interdisciplinary knowledge. You need... Um, Public, private, you need the different sectors, civil society, public, private, all the different actors around the table. You need the different levels at the table. The, the, the borough, the city, the metropolitan area, the, the national, even the EU. Can, you, you need all that. And out of that, you can create some sort of reaction and intelligence, say, okay, this is good, this is not good, this is usable, this is not usable. And so my last word of publicity, sorry, I come here for publicity. <laughs> um, I have created a con, and that's where I learn all these things. Um, it's called IGLUS, Innovative Governance of Large Urban Systems. It's basically a touring, we tour the world, and we look, innovative stands for smart. Uh, we tour the world and look at what cities do. <laughs> in reaction to digitalization. Because ultimately, and that's a clear statement, I think the urban area is the relevant entity. I'm not sure the nation state is. So let's go out and fight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. I think uh, we are closing the panel. Thanks a lot. Uh, maybe some applause for the uh, panelists. Um, Thanks a lot for coming here and, and for your willingness to, to, uh, to, to take this TA perspective and to discuss with us from this TA perspective, which is not your uh, original background, part of Armin, of course. Um, so I think I really enjoyed it, and uh, I leave it to you, Linda, to uh, say some famous last words. Oh. <laughs> yes, I also want to thank um, the panelists, and I also want to thank... Um, all the discussion because it was really enriching our um, our things about starting from the pacing problem and from the information problem and from the regulation problem. We touched so much issues. We touched trees. We touched uh, environmental uh, things. We touched on values. We touched on capitalism. We touched on the depression and um, revolution uh, aspects of TA. We touched on the history of TA, which was, was much more visionary in the past, maybe, as it is in the present. And so I think it's important that we keep these different perspectives also and learn also from other institutions in order to reflect how our position is and how we can include also with other institutions and have corporations also to have something um, against this 1,000 AI professions <laughs> in Bavaria, so we need something here also. My students uh, loved it. 1,000 uh, new jobs. Yes, <laughs> we see. In any case, I think we have uh, we have discussed a lot. We have um, opened um, for um, for lots lots of foods of thoughts for digital futures. We can continue discussions on in the TA community. And now I think there are some more famous last words given to um, Constanze and Armin. <laughs> <laughs>